Hello, I'm Peter Moore, and welcome to Travels Through Time, the podcast made in partnership with Colourgraph. I'm Peter Moore. Today we're heading back to the rich, rowdy, ruthless world of Rome with the much-loved novelist Lindsay Davis. For many years, the author Lindsay Davis has been captivating readers with her series of detective novels set in the ancient Roman world. Her great protagonists, Falco and Flavia Albia, are names that are probably already familiar to you and enough in themselves to conjure memories of thrilling, twisting tales in ancient Britain, or in the Eternal City itself. This spring, Davis has published the latest book in her Flavia Albia series. It's called A Comedy of Terrors, and it's set in Rome during the reign of the Emperor Domitian, and more specifically, during the week running up to the festival of Saturnalia. For us, this means the perfect guide and the ideal setting for a trip into the past. We'll be giving away a hardback copy of A Comedy of Terrors to one of our newsletter subscribers this week, so to be in with a chance of winning it, make sure you visit our site TTT Podcast and sign up. Otherwise, enjoy. Lindsay Davis, this is something I've been looking forward to. Welcome to Travel Through Time. I hope this is going to be good fun, and I suspect very much that it will be. First of all, let's um, let's say congratulations, because your new novel, Comedy of Terrors, is just out, and it's the ninth book in the Flavia Albia series, and I've been listening to it on audiobook over the last few days, and there's a wonderful narrator you have for your audiobooks, and it's really engrossing. It's very funny. <laughs> it's a great dive into the streets of the Eternal City. I suppose my first question to you, or prompt is a better way of putting it, could you just tell us about this new novel of yours a little bit, please? Yes. It's set in AD 89, which is also by chance, in fact, the year that I've chosen to travel to. It's the ninth story I've written about Flavia Albia, who, in fact, we met in my previous series about her father and mother, Falco and Helena. And she is a kind of detective. It's not entirely clear whether in the Roman world they had private eyes, but I feel there's something about the ambience of the big city of Rome that suits the Philip Marlowe kind of ambience that we are familiar with from later. And so having written about a male detective for 20 years, I decided it would be good that people were used enough to the concept of Rome itself for me to have a go at writing about a girl and be a girl because they're written in the first person. So this is what I am doing. And in this one, before I really knew that it, I was going to need to cheer people up because of COVID, I decided we'd reached Saturnalia, which is the sort of Roman equivalent of Christmas without Christ, but everything else is there, <laughs> including what I regard as the ghastliness of Christmas for the woman of the household trying to run things without everybody ending in tears. So, so we have that setting and then there has to be crimes going on. So part of the joke is that Saturnalia in Roman times was a total role reversal. So in this one, Albia doesn't have a job. Her husband has a job and his job is to do with a kind of mafia-like crime organisation, which she can only, for the most part, watch. The dark side and the joke side are mingled together. I think so. That's obviously captured in the title Comedy of Terrors, and I thought it's a really good opportunity to ask you a little bit about the Roman sense of humour, because I'd, and there's <laughs> always the trouble here about giving things away with plots, but I don't think it's too much to say that this new novel starts with a practical joke. Is that right? You're right. It is a practical joke. And there are other practical jokes of the kind that little children would very much enjoy. So we have we have that. And I think that is true to what 
we know about the Roman sense of humour, most of which is evidenced by graffiti, most of which is very rude. Really? So I've taken that as my way in. They say that these were really, really riotous days. And mm. there's reports of Pliny building a soundproof room so that he could work, so he could keep on with his working during the raucous celebrations. And What a misery that Pliny was. <laughs> is that right? I mean, is this... Is this how you, you know, kind of how can you create such, I suppose, the excitement of a, of a festival from the archives? Was it written about at great length by um, the main authors we know? I wouldn't say great length. No, there's enough for us to vaguely be able to imagine it. And a lot of my work is done by imagination, really. And, and putting human beings, because I think human nature doesn't change very much, into those kind of situations there are things we don't know the the very first scene is when albia takes two little boys to buy the statuettes that are supposed to be handed round as presents and we don't really know what what the statuettes were which of course causes me some problems mm. she has to say their origins lost in history in a sort of frosty I come from Britannia and I'm above this sort of way. So, yeah, I, I wanted to ask you about these because these seem to be, well, it's obviously nice to have an object to hook onto, and they are known as the Sigliaria. Is that correct? Is they, correct? they are, or possibly little Gaiuses. So they may be like gingerbread men, but we, we don't really know. That's all we know. But do any of them survive if, if they are objects? Have they come down to us today? not recognized as that so no in in that particular instance i was stymied hmm okay so plenty for us to talk about one thing you've alluded to already that is the fact that comedy of terrors is set in the year 89 and all of your books are um in this one particular series at least sorry i should clarify so I think this question I'm going to throw at you now, the one that I throw towards everyone who comes on this podcast, is going to be quite straightforward. But if you could travel back through time, Lindsay Davis, which year would you pick? <laughs> well, I'd go back to <laughs> AD 89. <laughs> Perfect. Could you, just, uh, could you just set up the year for us? Just tell us what's going on. Who's the emperor? What kind of status um, in the Roman story are we at? We're at um, the reign of the emperor Domitian, not well known, I think, to the general public, partly because in his own day, because he was viewed as a tyrant, he was, as they called it, damned to the memory. His statues were torn down and he, he was obliterated from public records in a way that with redaction and, and such is totally familiar to us. He has been on the throne for long enough to have made his mark on Rome, but to have become, in the words of Roman historians, more cruel, which presupposes he was cruel in the first place and got worse as time went on. So we're at a dark period in his reign. And it's a period in which a lot of things, this particular year, a lot of things happened. It started with a revolt in Germany, which upset Domitian very much because the man who revolted was one of his choices as a governor. Um, then he had to go and fight wars on the Danube, which he mainly ended by paying off the people he was fighting. Various other things happened, which we'll, we'll talk about. And we're edging towards, in a few years' time, his assassination by a committee. I, I love Domitian's assassination because, unlike most times when tyrants or rulers are got rid of it's not the next man coming along who kills him off nobody wanted the job in fact so um, a sort of civil service committee had to get together and and dispose of him for the good of rome asking people would they be next and getting the answer no which is one of the funniest things in roman history to me as an ex-civil servant so here we are, this dark period. In Albia's life, she's been married for three uh, uh, months, three months, yes. 
Uh, her husband was struck by lightning on their wedding day, so she, her marriage has not turned out to be exactly as she thought, because uh, being struck by lightning, I found out retrospectively, is, is truly terrible physically and mentally. Um, and they've just adopted two little boys, age three and five, so without having intended to be part of a family, she suddenly finds herself in this unwanted position mm. it's good because you've given us both sides there there's the historical record and there's um the fiction that you've layered over it if people were wanting to to research this particular era in roman history is it well documented is it there in the major sources no it's documented but not well there are a few books written about domitian himself by modern historians and they do their best but the most marked thing in them is that they frequently have to say we don't really know how many triumphs he had how many wars he fought why he did this or that how he was viewed who his friends were whether his wife loved him or stuck with him for the position there is there is so much about Domitian that is conjectural that it's very difficult to um, research it and a lot of things that he did were subsequently taken over by the next lot of emperors for instance i think the most obvious one that people will know about trajan's column set in trajan's market shows trajan's wars against the Dacians, which actually started out as Domitian's wars against the Dacians, and the plan for the markets, which you can go and see and marvel at, was probably begun by Domitian himself, but it's, it's all been taken over and his name has been forgotten. So he could have had, if he'd lived, Domitian's column, mm. and he would have been a much better known emperor. Exactly, but I suppose all of this space kind of black space, if we can think about it, mm. in those terms in the historical record is so inviting to someone with oh, yeah. an imagination like <laughs> yours. Yeah. And I've written about his father, who was a good emperor and, and made the trains run on time. And to be honest, to write about a bad emperor is, is much more fun, really. Is there, um, is a, it's kind of a crass question in a way, but it's a really fun one at the same time, because you've been writing about him or his period for so long. Is there a political equivalent from our times that you've um, had popping up in your imagination as you've done it, or does he really stand alone as his own person? I, I think he does, to some extent, stand alone. Even among mad Roman emperors, he's different from the ones we, we think of primarily Caligula and Nero, because he's very intelligent and he's he's trying to be well thought of. He's not totally bonkers. So although when I was writing a book about an election set in Domitian's reign, people kept saying how like it was to the EEC ref referendum here and then to Donald Trump. In fact, it's not really quite the same, though it makes you think that it could be. Well, here we are. We're in AD 89. Where would you like to go for your first of your three scenes, please? Well, I alluded to having been a civil servant. And so I would like to go to the Bay of Naples. I know you've had this done during the Pompeii and Herculaneum disaster. But I would like to go 10 years after the actual eruption of Mount Vesuvius. And I would like to see how they're getting on with reconstruction. Well, you're, you're right. We have talked about the eruption itself, the Pliny's and their diverging stories with um, Daisy Dunn. And I think a probably fair to say that the eruption of Mount Vesuvius is one of those moments in Roman history that people tend to know even if they don't know much else in AD 79. Do we know anything about the aftermath of the explosion at all that might give us a bit of a hint of what was going on? We know a little bit. We know that when it immediately had happened it was like the Krakatoa explosion and that the whole world was dark, crops didn't grow, the sun was blotted out people died of 
plague, dare I use that word, in lockdown. And then we know that first the Emperor Titus, in whose reign it happened, though that was a very short reign, he made efforts to go down there and help the people. We know that some people did survive. There's a district of um, modern Naples that was, was called Herculaneum. So obviously people did find somewhere to shelter. We also know that there were pieces of land whose owners could not be traced. And um, Titus and presumably Domitian afterwards allocated this land to other people to try and get the place revived again. But it's perfectly obvious from the way the towns were buried that there were whole districts, whole cities that were just left under their metres and metres of ash. I'm trying to think of an equivalent. I suppose in our time, and all it's a very different bit of science, you can look towards the Chernobyl explosion and how that particular area was like ringed off, obviously for <laughs> reasons of radioactivity, which they didn't have um, at this moment. But and it, there is a similarity, I suppose, with this idea really? of buried history, buried people. Um, so the landscape would look quite peculiar. Um, and, and the other thing with all volcanoes is that you would think, why would people go back when it's known that at some point they will... Um, erupt again the land becomes very fertile and so that's a draw exactly I mean what would what do you think um and how I suppose my question is how was an event as peculiar and devastating as that interpreted by maybe people in Rome as far away as that did they talk about oh I think they did yes I think they were aware that something truly terrible had happened I have read that they heard about it within a day, so the Imperial Post would have rushed to tell the Emperor about it. And there were many people in Rome, especially the rich people, who had holiday homes down there, which they would have lost. So they would have, there would have been people in Rome who had a personal interest in the place. And then it's so beautiful. The Bay of Naples is just so wonderful. They went on holiday there. They went for long periods in the summer. Um, and they, they must have known that that was all lost, let alone the actual loss of life. I suppose and this is the tales on from what we were talking to Daisy about, because when she was looking at Pliny the Elder, it was very much a story of trying to find almost, I don't know if rational explanation is the right way to term it, but just to look into natural phenomena and... Um, render it sensible in some way was you always yes. have this tension between I suppose rationalization and and the more kind of supernatural explanation where do you think people stood in terms of the volcano what how did people interpret something like that everything that I've read about it including Pliny the Younger's legendary descriptions he, he did too he polished up his first one and did it again they don't make it out to be mystical in any way his fascination is geological really um, and it's interesting that he wrote something so precise that it it's become the bedrock of volcanology really they must have known about volcanoes before of course they did they they knew about mount etna for example and and there would have been volcanic activity both in Italy and certainly in Greece and Turkey near nearby and Egypt as well. But there's something about maybe the unexpectedness of Vesuvius and the huge size of the explosion because it had been brewing for so long that seems to have attracted the Roman mind as much as it attracts us. Um, so I was wondering because of the the timing of the eruption 79 AD coming after a period although you might always say there was upheavals in Roman history but you'd had a lot of political upheaval maybe over the two decades before was there any sense of there being some element of punishment or is that to be divided I've not found that I think I think that's a modern interpretation they they had had disturbance in the Julio-Claudian period 
but they had also had nearly 10 years of Vespasian's reign, which was very much reconstruction. So you, another point that you mentioned, of course, it's wonderful to think of the landscape around the mountain and how it's changed and how things are buried. This was an area of resorts, holiday homes and big villas, as you said. Where would where would the wealthy move to for their like kind of holiday homes? Was there a was there a kind of alternative, do you think? I, that's why I want to go back and have a look. Peter. Mm. <laughs> they had holiday homes in other places on the Italian lakes, for example, in the mountains. Vespasian and his sons kept going back to their origins in the Sabine Hills. So they liked the country life. That was always part of the Roman traditional psyche was that they came from farming stock, although Vespasian was in fact sneered at for being a country boy. So there would have been plenty of other places and, and the very rich were so rich that if they lost a villa on the Bay of Naples, it was only one of many, many that they owned. But the place is just so special. I, I believe they must have come back. But all the best sites are the sites that were buried. Starby Eye, for example, on the cliff top. It's such an interesting choice. And of course, if you were to go to Vesuvius, the obvious selection would be to see the eruption. But what it was like... No, no, I don't want to see the eruption. I've been scared to death of the eruption. That's that's a good point as well. We'd probably watch it from a distance if we were to watch it at all. But yeah, I I suppose there's that element of going somewhere in the aftermath and it would have been thick in the atmosphere still, not in a physical sense, but culturally. So that's probably a great one to ponder. I imagine you have visited Pompeii on many occasions. It's just a it's just yes. an opportunity for me to ask you if there's anything in that extraordinary place which remains with you as a snapshot of these scenes of Roman life that you distill into into your novels. Has is anything from that that Pompeii site, you know, kind of just lingered more strongly? The whole the whole business of daily life encapsulating the the fact that there are stoves with the food still in the pannikins that were being cooked up at the time that sort of thing stays with me my favorite actual site is um at aplontis it's the villa that we think was owned by nero's wife babea at torian and Ciata, as it's now called so so that's a a big grand house by the sea but my favorite bit of that is a swimming pool where I can imagine people rushing out and putting their towels on. Oh you've actually given us a perfect link to where we are going to go (laughs) next. I don't know if you've got it yet but if you have where would you like to go for your second scene? Well this also has something to do with Nero in fact it has everything to do with Nero. I would like to go to Syria um, which apart from being a very interesting Roman province at the time anyway is where the third manifestation of false Nero's occurred. There had been one in the reign of Vespasian and one in the reign of Titus, both of which were swiftly dealt with. But then yet another, probably a shepherd, possibly put up to it, arose in Syria and claimed to be Nero, who it was claimed had not died. I'm fascinated by this phenomenon of a ruler that to us was a disaster being there in the popular imagination. It's the Elvis lives of the Roman world, really. Mm. And he he had some success in attracting followers, though, of course, in the Near East, there's quite a lot of that goes on in one way and another. I have written a book about it, which I developed ludicrously because that's allowed to me, but it was seen by the authorities as something quite dangerous and and it's lived on in mystical literature as a kind of um, antichrist. It was possible to claim that this ruler who had been denounced by the Senate and forced to commit suicide hadn't done so and that he would still have a following. Yeah, it's strange that people would want to resurrect Nero. We'll get on to that in a moment, because I think let's just iron out the history. So Nero's 
Nero's reign was up till 68, was that right? That's right. And then you have the thing called the year of the four emperors. Which is 68. Yes, 68 into 69. It's it's slightly more than a year. Mm. And the one who won was Vespasian. Nero, of course, killed his mother and was known to be a wild and tyrannical emperor who was forced to commit suicide very famously. And he has two people before this yes. pretending to be him. I suppose the equivalent I was thinking of, in English history at least, is the princes in the tower of the late 15th century. They generated quite a lot of impersonators because they were not known to have died. Their mysterious endings were reconciled in strange stories that bubbled up later on. But, but Nero, is it, it's absolutely known that he died and his body was picked up by his old nurse and buried. He has a tomb, even though he... He was a tyrant who was persuaded to kill himself. He's got a tomb in Rome where he is buried by people who knew him. To us, there's there's no doubt that he's dead. And yet you still get this strange wanting to be him thing. Mm. Um, I, I did actually think about that, although I don't want to um, relate ancient Rome to modern America too much. When Donald Trump was evicted from office, only just, let's think about it, he was only just unsuccessful in the election. There seemed to be parallels in that a man with blonde hair, though that's that's just the novelist in me speaking, who half of society would say was a terrible affliction politically, nonetheless had followers who were equally determined that he was the best ruler that could have happened and the same thing seems to have happened with Nero. This is really fascinating so do you think there is some um, significance to the fact that this third Nero if we shall call him that Hmm. came from Syria is there some political or historical significance there? Well it's a long way away so it's it's easier for it to happen without somebody saying, look, he's over there in his tomb. And there was, there was clearly there was bad feeling against Rome in that part of the world. We'd had, just before Vespasian was emperor, there'd been the Judean revolt. Um, and it was also a place where strange religious cults could start. I see it as a part of the world where fermenting of weirdness could happen. I suppose does it talk very strangely I suppose this is the thing that gets back to modern day politics is this a kind of nostalgic or yeah. kind of weird nostalgic reaction to I think it is. rulers like Nero and Trump and others always promise the people that they are they are the men who know what the people really want so it's it's very easy for a groundswell of he was ours and he's been destroyed cruelly but he'll come back so what was the story then how did this play out with the false nero well the, number three? the third one we we know um more about the first two the third one's a bit as they say in textbooks shadowy which is always good for a novelist like me because I can fill in the shadows. But it seems that he he arose, he got a lot of followers. The Romans heard about him and went to apprehend him. So he fled to Parthia. Parthia was one of Rome's um, traditional enemies at the time. And Parthia received him, but then handed him over diplomatically. And we don't know what happened to him, except if you read my Arbia story, you do know what happened to him. But Nero would be past 50 by this point. So I don't suppose, well, it's ludicrous in one sense, because it's not how we think of Nero. But did, did anyone take this seriously in, um, in Rome at all? Or was it a provincial story? I think in Rome, they always took any kind of revolt or uprising seriously. Mm. Does it tell us something about Nero's posthumous reputation or is it difficult to read anything into this moment? Well, Nero liked a mission there's two sides to. Um, 
he he may have been a better ruler than the mad stories say in the great fire of rome which we famously think of as having been started by nero so he could clear the ground for his golden heirs there are balancing stories that he opened the palace and gave shelter to the people who'd lost their homes so also as a civil servant i i think that when you have a totally mad ruler in fact sometimes countries do better because while he's prancing around being bonkers the clerks just get on and run things nicely without interference and and you can actually have a better run empire as it were hi i'm artemis one of the presenters on this podcast at travels through time we're incredibly proud to be partnering with jordan lloyd one of the world's leading visual historians His extraordinary photo colorization work has appeared on the covers of National Geographic, Life and People magazines, and he's worked on special projects for titles like The Times of London and NPR. Through his expertly researched and detailed work, Jordan has brought to life some of the most famous events and people from modern history, whether it's his portrait of Abraham Lincoln or his sweeping panorama of the D-Day beaches in 1944. One of my current favourites is a photograph taken on the 1911 Terra Nova expedition to the Antarctic. The original shot is strange and beautiful, and it shows just how otherworldly parts of our planet can sometimes look. But the image is completely elevated by the deep and icy blues that Jordan's colourisation work brings out. This, alongside many others, are available to buy as prints, and they make an unusual and striking present for that friend or family member of yours who loves the past. To find your favourite historical image, have a look at Jordan's site at www.colorgraph.co. Okay, so so let's keep moving forward through the year 89. Mm -hmm. Where would you like to go to last, please? Well, I'd I'd like to go to Rome itself. I have to to go there at some point. And I, I really, if you'll let me, I'd like to conflate two dinner parties giant dinner parties hosted by Domitian, one of which is his black banquet where he terrified members of the Senate. And the other is his supposedly more joyous banquet for the whole of Rome, though in fact, I think it didn't actually occur in Rome, which is just typical of the shadowiness of Domitian's reign. It sounds absolutely extraordinary. Academic historians like to say if it really happened, but there are so many details of this that they're they're just not joining in the fun of it. It was supposed to have been a banquet for the fallen in Dacia that had been a terrible disaster. And so there is this banquet in their honour and Domitian invited all the Senate whom he loathed and who knew he loathed them to come to the palace for a banquet. Um, When they got there, they were separated out from their drivers and slaves. So they're on their own. And these these are men who are accustomed to being surrounded by a lot of attendants. So suddenly they're all on their own and they're led inside the palace to the banqueting hall where they find the whole room has been painted black, floor, ceilings, doors, windows covered. And instead of dining couches, they have sort of funeral couches, beside each of which is what appears to be a gravestone with their name on it. At this point, they are no doubt not happy men. So the evening proceeds with them being served funeral food by strange naked little boys who are painted black from head to foot who serve them. And Domitian is the only person who talks, and he talks constantly of death. At the end of the meal, they're allowed to go home, but not in their own carriages. Transport is provided, and they then think they're going to be taken to the back streets and killed. But no, they're they're taken home. They go to bed, and at dawn, they're woken by thunderous knocking on the door. Thunderous knocking on the door is what happens when Domitian is going to execute you, and he sends a troop of soldiers at dawn to get you. So they they are, again, terrified. But what they find is that Domitian, as an evil joke, has sent them presents. Their presence being 
the tombstones from beside their couches, which turn out to be solid silver, aren't they lucky? And the little naked boys. Um, I've had a lot of fun writing about how lewd little boys given to respectable households will have been a bit of a problem for those households to manage because they couldn't get rid of them they were presents from Domitian but who wants a stage school child who's been taught to dance promiscuously landed in their nice house so that's that um, and the other one is in a poem by Statius a Roman poet who I despise immensely because he's so creepy in his uh, obsequiousness to Domitian but he writes a poem about the time he was invited to a Saturnalia dinner by Domitian with everyone in fact reading between the lines it actually happened at Alba Longa which is Domitian's sinister citadel in the hills rather than in Rome but Statius writes it as if it's happening in in the middle of Rome and many commentators seem to assume it happened in what we know as the Colosseum and and that's Domitian trying to pretend to be the really jovial host and to my mind not not quite succeeding but that's good fun I'd like to go to both of those because I always like a good dinner <laughs> well we started off with my question about comedy and this is a very dark comedy in, indeed with the black banquet he's a paranoid tyrant so his sense of humor is not the same as anybody else's <laughs> but you said before that you know some academics might treat it with skepticism whereabouts is this chronicled could you just tell us a bit about the history of it please it's in um i think the most detailed description of it is in cassius dio who is a historian writing a long time after the event but but he gives all those details that i I relate to you so yes it's, it's I think it's really appealing because it, it it's got this um obviously there's the comic touch there's the food which is uh you know such a part of the Roman story anyway the big banquets and the status but yes. the fact that everyone's terrified there Domitian is enjoying the fact that they're terrified mm. he's deliberately making them terrified and then he's str striding about enjoying the macabre situation that he set up without actually having to execute a whole lot of people but would that be quite roman do you think that's quite roman quintessentially i can't think of anything else quite as horrible there are bad things done by other nutty emperors we mentioned the great fire of rome and nero when afterwards he wanted to blame the christians he he had horrible punishments genuinely imposed on them um but the wittiness because it is a very witty thing to have done is unique to domitian as far as i know mm. what kind of i mean what kind of food would appear at one of the let's go to the more um big friendly banquet for the, the roman people what kind of food would be served at a an occasion like that i always say slightly lukewarm and gives you a stomach ache because of the size of it um you you'd have your starters which would be little tasty hors d'oeuvre sort of things and then you'd have main dishes all of which would be things like stews that are cut into small pieces because you don't have a knife and fork in when you dine in Rome. So it all has to be either finger food, as we call it now in catering, or, or something that you can just get on a spoon quite easily. And then a lot of sweet meats, especially at Saturnalia, there'd be lots of fruit. We, we know that there were. Um, Things brought from all over the empire to show what a wonderful empire you lived in. Things from re remote countries that because of Rome's commerce, it was able to import. At this moment in the Roman story, the great story of Rome, if we go back to the Black Banquet and you imagine yourself mm. sitting there, I don't know, is it one of those moments where power just feels so i don't know almost tangible in the air do you think yes i think so and i think 
he meant it to be. He was saying that they they were the ruling body up to a point. They had, when he assumed the throne, they had given him all his powers. That was how it worked. Um, it's like the state opening of parliament, as mm. it were, that um, the, the top person arrives as if they are joining in. But now Domitian is the one in charge and he holds their lives and their deaths in his hand. So I think that's, you're quite right. It's one man has all the power and that's that's what's dangerous, of course, in Imperial. And world. it's at moments like this that we can look to today's politics, can't we? And see that like the, this, I suppose, projection of power, the big military displays, the big meetings, yeah. it's still there, isn't it? It is still there. And and I have thought of it um, looking at America more more so than here when um, both Trump and Biden took office in the way that they assumed the right to do everything. And that was again, it's it's one man, isn't it? Finger on the button in our world mm. exemplifies it. But everything else comes down to what that one man wants his administration to be and the same thing happened i think in rome when tribunician power as it, it was called was given to an emperor in 89 we we said earlier that he ends up being assassinated where was his story in 89 was this like a high point for him was he quite established in power because he what is his reign 14 15 years it was quite a long time wasn't it Yes, and this is about the ninth year, so he is very established. He's also, he's still quite a young man. So the expectation, if he's not assassinated, is that he could be there for a very long time. Um, what he's doing, apart from fighting wars on the frontier, is he's totally rebuilding Rome. Much of what we think of as ancient Rome um, was reconstructed because it had been damaged in a fire during his brother's reign or rebuilt and expanded and beautified by Domitian. So he's making the whole city his Rome um, and he's doing it very well, very successfully. He had plenty of money because his father as an ex-tax collector's grandson knew how to manage a treasury. We should say, as we're talking about food, I'm going to make the, the kind of dovetail here into uh, a comedy of terrors again, that there are some quite good pies, which turn out to be quite bad pies, actually, <laughs> in the book. We do know that they had pies. We, we have um, the models for making pies. We also know that they, they liked pies that weren't what they seemed. So if you had like a, what looked like a rabbit pie, it would actually be fish inside. One of the good things about writing a series is that you you can have an idea in one and then you can sort of prettify it up later on and you can develop and develop. And Zero's Pie Shop, as beloved by the bad judge Marponius in the Falco series, has run from book to book. And now we finally get to go there so that we can see both a pie shop and a bakery. And the bakery is based on one that I had seen in the days when I could travel. You might as well give us the, uh, the, the, the kind of the top two or three pies from Zero's, if you can. Oh, oh, well, they're, they're more like the bottom <laughs> pies. <laughs> um, there's, there's every kind of meat pie that you could want. They tend to be meat rather than fish from Zero's. And they have flavourings like juniper. And there's one with venison plums, I think. I did, to some extent, devise the ingredients, but they're ingredients that we know were in the Roman Empire. So I'm, I'm doing it as it could be. Yeah. There's always pie of the day as well. So I, I don't know what pie of the day today is actually, Peter. I oh, well. haven't been able to find out. <laughs> I am a pie lover myself. Yeah, I um, quite like to say there was one with garlic and rosemary, which was appealing. Oh, yes. Yes, that, that would be a good one. Um, my my favourite cookery book is uh, The Hairy Biker's Book of Pies. And I think <laughs> in Comedy of Terrors, you can tell that. Brilliant. Um, well, I suppose we can, again, do some more dovetailing because we can imagine one of these pies maybe being there at the, at the Black Banquet in some 
in some role or other. But I yeah. should say that the, the pies do have a plot plot role in the in the new novel. They so do. people, they do. I like I like my plots to um, to work as much as possible. And um, Saturnalia, one of the things they did that I think we don't do so much is they threw nuts at people. We tend to just eat nuts, but we we picked up the nut connection and um, because i wanted to have some sort of cartel going it's a cartel where they don't manage the nuts properly so people that's why people are ill really yeah. and a pie with bad nuts is um a cause for concern but they're useful projectile i suppose nuts because they you could do a bit of damage but not too much they're kind of a great irritant i imagine but um <laughs> i feel like we've gone into roman cuisine in quite a fun way so that's uh something for people to to maybe imagine but you you've got one more question coming from me before i let you come come out of the year 89 and mm -hmm. if you could get one tangible object if you get one tangible object and bring it back with you to have as a talisman or something to have in your office today, what would you like? I'd, I'd like it in my cellar, actually. Okay. Um, an object is too small a word, really. I'd like a giant Roman cullius, which is an enormous barrel of Falernian wine from the slopes of Vesuvius. Oh, goodness. So that I could see if it really was as good as they said. And um, if so, I could then drink it. So is this something that um, people talk about anecdotally? Does it pop up quite often? It's the most famous wine for learning. And it's, it's, it's in all the authors who, who speak of top grade wine. And um, being grown in full sun on a slope, of a volcano would give it a special characteristic. There's wine they make now that they say is the same, but I, I, I'd like to know. Well, I, I suppose we can make a bargain. You can have it as long as you invite me around and we can, I will we can have a bit as well. Listen, this has been great fun. I think we've touched on all sorts of things which take us right free to today, but um, I should, you know, kind of leave with a last word on the comedy of a comedy of terrors which is a really really fun book thank you very much lindsay davis it's been a real pleasure thanks for coming on travel tree time thank you very much that was me peter moore talking to the brilliant lindsay davis about volcanoes emperors and pies just the other day if this conversation has interested you then do check out lindsay's newly released novel it's called a comedy of terrors and it takes you on a much deeper dive into this fascinating world Remember, there's so much more on our website for you to check out if you like about this episode and about the historical period that it deals with. It's tttpodcast.com and by signing up to our newsletter, you'll be in with a chance of winning this and many other first edition hardbacks. We're going to be back next Tuesday, but from me for now, that's it. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>